The iron flute. Case 93. Toksan's lion cub. While Toksan was working in the garden one day, he saw a monk approaching up the road. Toksan closed the gate. Fugai comments, Toksan has ended. The monk rapped on the gate. Fugai, too late. Toksan said, who is it? Fugai, a monster. The monk answered, a lion cub. Fugai, the lion cub enters the fox's lair. Toksan opened the gate. Fugai, he puts his head in the lion's mouth. The monk bowed low. Fugai, his fur does not look like a lion's. Toksan jumped on his back and held him down, saying, You devil, where have you been? Fugai. That's the way to raise a cub. Genro. At first, I thought he was a real cub, but now I see his strength is less than that of a fox. He should have jumped Toksan and held him helpless the moment the gate was opened. Fugai. You devil. Nyogen Senzaki. Hangetsu says it was a good show. The curtain should be lowered to mark the conclusion. I agree with her. Genro, like a country bumpkin, made a noisy remark for nothing. The midsummer breeze enters the room where Kangetsu and I are working together. Why would we question the breeze, asking, what is it? Where is it from? We just welcome it without calling it either devil or angel. And since Fugai and Genro are always commenting, I will add my own note here. Kangetsu is the Dharma name Nyogen Senzaki gave to his beloved disciple, Ruth Strout McCandless, who collaborated with him on his writings and translations and edited much of his work, including the Iron Flute and the book Buddhism and Zen. He wrote a poem to her on January 16th, 1946. My English writings have too many rips and rents. Who else can stitch and mend except the old friend Kangetsu? And now Genro's verse with comments by Fugai after each line. He calls himself a lion and visits a lion tamer. He roars like a lion. That voice shatters the monastery. The echo resounds from mountain to valley. The lion becomes a donkey. 
he should learn acrobatics. Defeated before he can kick. After the thunder, no rain. Happy 4th of July. I think the fireworks have already begun. Happy Independence Day. Happy Interdependence Day. Last year was our 45th anniversary and it had to be online. The pandemic had surged with the Delta variant. We weren't able to invite the Sangha back. I was here with the residents and a few additional officers, including our tech wizard for Zoom, Myogen. What a harrowing year it's been. So many deaths from the coronavirus, from war, from civilian gun violence, from hunger, the assaults on democracy, on human rights. And ever worsening on Mother Earth. I was reading my notes from last year's anniversary Tay show in which I said, as the hellfires rage across our planet, as the three poisons of greed, anger, and ignorance are literally destroying the earth, we are called We are called to be emissaries of Jizo, the Bodhisattva who goes into hell to bring succor to all those suffering there. Om ka 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 bi Swaka. Our planetary environment has become a hell realm, and our practice has never been more urgent. Hakuin Zenji said in his Rohatsu exhortations. Beings await your enlightenment as keenly as they would await 
a small rain cloud on the distant horizon during a drought. How can you sit so half-heartedly? You must have a great vow to save them all. Time passes like an arrow. It waits for no one. Exert yourself. Exhaust your self. This great Bodhisattva mountain is exactly where we need to be to intensify our vow. Training for our lives, for all lives, for this Daibosatsu Zendo was established. Now, on this 46th anniversary, how joyous to be sitting here together. This morning's ceremony at the end of chanting Daihishu, the great compassionate Dharani, and again at the end of chanting Daisegaki for all those who have passed on, both times a great wind shook the trees. Thank you. Welcome to the universe. Your home. And then that walk around the lake Beyond words. I'm told that as I teetered precariously alongside the Buddha, a beaver appeared from the water and joined us in chanting on the bay, Davide, so. We bowed with tears of gratitude to our teachers, Daibosatsu Zendo's founders. We celebrated as Walt Whitman put it, we celebrated ourselves waking up to who we truly are and indeed intensifying our vow.
It's been 48 years since I first began living at Chiracuan, as the Beecher House was named in 1974. And a week ago, I stayed one night in the newly renovated building. I so deeply felt the simultaneity of past, present, future. Standing in front of the building, looking out, this open 360 degree gaze. the interrelationship of trees, mountain, lake, grasses, flowers, just flowing through me. Then and now, same moment. Seeing through the same eyes as that 30-year-old young woman. Touching the same source. feeling the same wonder. Yet, with all the differentiation of the day in, day out, ever-changing circumstances, No birth and death and no end to birth and death. And maybe I will turn 80 next year. The late Omori Sogen Roshi said, past, present, future, any time must be grasped now in the immediate moment. Spatially, any place must be grasped here where you stand. Anyone old, young, men, women, must be grasped as oneself. This is the principle of the universality of human being. In other words, at the center of the crossing of time and space, this so-called self moves. The world of this free activity is the world of nirvana. This world of nirvana is not separate and far away from the reality here and now in which you live and move. Nirvana is not a faraway dream world. It is this very world in which you suffer. 
only in the world of nirvana can you experience the end and the means as one. And every day is a fine day. Whatever you do is fulfilling in itself. Master Hakuin, in his poisonous commentary on the Heart Sutra, grieves about many people's misunderstanding of ultimate nirvana. They take it to be a calm condition without activity and fall into the pit of passivity. This empty, quiet state of no activity is death-like and resembles the life of a ghost. It has less value than rotten socks. <laughs> Rather than this, Hakuin says, the birth and destruction of all living things as they are is the nirvana of all the Buddhas. Our continuously changing daily lives, just as they are, in which we laugh, cry, suffer, enjoy, live, and die, is the nirvana of all the Buddhas." End quote. So it was with our beginnings here. We had a wonderful innocence We were finding our way. What is it to establish, never mind a monastery, a Zen community? There was much activity, much laughter, many tears. No one knew what the future would bring. Even with Edo Roshi's clear vision and the aspiration of each one of us, many struggles lay ahead. Just as today, we were hit with terrible inflation, which through the construction of the monastery into uncertainty. And there was confusion, sadness, Disturbances in the field of human relations. Yet, we persisted again and again, returning to the source. We knew the wonder of being here. opening into the interrelationship of all Buddhas, all beings, hearing the sermons of insentient creatures, feeling this sacred, momentous place and time. The nirvana of all the Buddhas.
And on September 13, 1972, we had the mountain opening ceremony, Kai San Shiki. In the silver light, as gentle raindrops fell, just around this spot, Edo Roshi addressed the deities of Daibosatsu Mountain, Lake, and Field. On behalf of all the Sangha, I ask your forgiveness for our destruction and pollution of all rocks, trees, grasses, and mosses, and the nature of the Catskill Mountains, particularly by the Beecher Lake. We ask your permission to establish a Zen monastery on this very site and ask your protection from earth, water, fire, and wind, and any other possible damage. May this place be peaceful, calm, creative, and harmonious for all the years to come and for all people who may come here generation after generation. And so in Roshi offered this verse. In this bottomless lake, let us put sun, moon, and all stars. On this boundless field, countless bodhisattvas are being born. <laughs> So the following year, September, no, spring, following six months from September to spring, 73, ground was broken for this. And the spring after that, my first husband, Shoro Lu Nordstrom, and I were asked to be co-directors of the first summer community at Jirakuan, the Beecher House. And at the end of summer, we found that we couldn't leave. So Lou gave up his tenure track teaching position at Marymount College, Tarrytown. And I gave up my job as public relations director. And with five others, we stayed on as residents. That first winter was really something. We had no heat. Almost every day we had to break up the ice in the Buddha bowl. And what a cast of characters. All seven of us of dubious sanity. We were so good at seeing what was wrong with each other. <laughs> Living there felt at times like something out of a Stephen King novel. 
<laughs> Our main task was to keep the road open, taking turns before dawn, one of us driving and two of us riding in the back of the old blue pickup truck with its rear window cracked from being hit by the shovel as we threw sand and salt onto the road every morning. Why? So that the construction crews could get up here and keep working. We held session in Jiraco on before and after that winter. Some of them with Soen Roshi as well as Edo Roshi present. And as the monastery neared completion, we did our first session in this building right here, where you are sitting, you guys, on plywood with sheetrock dust so thick we could hardly see each other. And with Edo Roshi saying, we are the screws that are anchoring this floor. So at the end of the summer of 1975, we moved into this building. We did Newazume. Each of us walking up the road and begging for admission. <laughs> Go away! The gate slamming shut, just as with the monk in today's koan. Knocking on the gate, refusing to leave. Who is it? Who are you? Each of us, <laughs> a lion cub. <laughs> so excited to be here. So filled with key enthusiasm to meet the challenges of Shugyo, true practice. Little did we know. Edo Roshi opened the gate for us, just as Toksan did for that monk. Each of us bowed low, and then received our room assignment and proceeded to do Tangario, sitting alone all night. And from that day forward, arduous practice began. Monastic practice began. All kinds of rules, some of which I don't think many of you even know, such as don't take seconds if you still have food in that bowl, such as the Buddha bowl, the first bowl, holds the grain. And breakfast, it's gruel. Lunch, some other grain. Supper, perhaps bread. But for breakfast and lunch, what we offer on the Saba boards must come from that Buddha bowl. 
Not a piece of salad from your third bowl, not a bean from your second bowl. What if you haven't taken any gruel? From now on, what will you do? Take gruel. At least enough to put a little pinch of seven grains on the saba bowl board, right? So yes, many, many rules. And Edo Roshi jumped on our backs, demanding, where have you been? Where are you wandering here and there? Where are you now? And we were devils. And we were angels. We began, as we settled into the practice, to see how the weight of our own self-absorbed convictions held us down. Quite a heavy burden on our backs. Submitting to the demands of koan work, formal training, learning the monastic regulations and rituals with our bodies. We cannot listen to someone say, okay, you do this and you do this and write it down and then consult our notes. That doesn't work, you may have noticed. The more we do it, the more the body knows what to do. And it just flows. And the mistakes that are made are wonderful. So session after session, we did that first part that Giyun spoke of in his wonderful talk yesterday, looking deep within, sitting with all the uncertainties, noticing our karmic imprints. Starting to question long-held beliefs and opinions. And beginning to drop everything we thought defined us, all the delusions of separate selfhood. Doesn't this sound like what we're doing here? Session is this work of transformation. And at the same time as Nyogen Senzaki said, Where did it go?
The midsummer breeze enters the room where Kangetsu and I are working together. We are working together. Why would we question the breeze? Asking what is it? Where is it from? We just welcome it without calling it either devil or angel. So speaking of transformation, we can look at the life of Toksan Senkan, the Zen master in today's koan from the iron flute. He was born in 782 in the Sichuan province in northwestern China. And he became a Buddhist monk at a very young age and studied the precepts, the, the sutras, and the shastras. And he was especially drawn to the Diamond Sutra. And achieved considerable renown as an expert. Now, some of you may remember what Shunryu Suzuki Roshi said in Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind about becoming an expert. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the experts, there are few. Toksan had great confidence in himself as a purveyor of the Diamond Sutra's teachings. He was a purveyor of goods, but we might say a purveyor of stolen goods. They were not yet his own. Confidence in himself. You know what Master Rinzai told his monks is telling us here today. You know what ails you? What ails you is a lack of self-confidence. But what is the self he's talking about here? Rinzai's self-confidence can be found in one of his most famous sayings, just become the master of circumstances wherever you are. Then any place you stand, any place you sit is the true place. But Tokson's confidence was based on his personal achievement. Confidence in what the Diamond Sutra calls a separated individuality is false confidence. And because it is false confidence, it is very easily disrupted. Have you noticed? Yeah, I got it. I understand. Right. Ooh. Seeing self and other as two and seeing one's own achievement as something to hold on to, to grasp, and protect is false 
confidence. Shodo Hararoshi, in his book Moon by the Window, said, Unless we awaken to the truth of no self and no other, we will only be confident when things are going the way we want them to go. The limited confidence of the ego depends on an external position. And when that position is gone, its confidence is gone as well." End quote. So Toksan was depending upon his external position as Diamond Sutra scholar of great renown, but he had not mastered the Diamond Sutra to become this master. is to know that these teachings are none other than your own experience. To feel that these words come from your own heart. Most of you know the story of Toksan, but it is our own story. He had heard that the Zen school in southern China taught a special transmission outside the sutras. What? His entire life was devoted to sutra study. So he decided to travel south to set those Buddhist heretics straight. Have you ever taken a position based on your own views, sure of your own opinions. How recently was that? Have you ever believed your own thoughts? And then, of course, the next step is imposing them on others. So there was Toksan. He'll go and set them on the true path. He went south along the Yangtze River and stopped at a tea shop run by an elderly woman. And he ordered a tenjin. Now this word, tenjin, means both snack and refreshing the mind, lighting up the mind. So the woman asked him, what are you carrying in that heavy pack? Maybe she saw his burdened mind, his spoiling for a fight. He proudly replied, My commentaries on the Diamond Sutra. Oh, she said, I understand that in that sutra, it is said, past mind cannot be grasped. 
present mind cannot be grasped. Future mind cannot be grasped. So, with what mind will you have your Tenjin? If you can tell me, you can have it for free. If you cannot, I won't give it to you. Toksan was dumbfounded. How could this little old lady in a tea shop ask him a question that he couldn't answer? How could he, the great Diamond Sutra scholar, be brought low by this nobody? It was a feeling of total humiliation. Now you know, total humiliation is absolutely necessary. It's where true practice begins. It's when you bow low with no idea of who you are or what you're doing. Lion cub, mangy dog, purification can occur when there is nothing left to carry around. And I love what Abraham Lincoln said. Some of you have heard this before. An Eastern monarch once charged his wise men to invent for him a sentence to be ever in view and which should be true and appropriate in all times and situations. They presented him with the words, does anybody remember? This too shall pass. And this too shall pass. This too shall pass away. And Lincoln continued, how much it expresses, how chastening in the hour of pride, how consoling in the depths of affliction. How chastening in the hour of pride. In his humiliation, Toksan realized he needed to ask for guidance. This is really important. If we experience humiliation and just wallow in it and don't ask for guidance, then it just becomes another toxic plume in a poisoned stream.
Many of us know the feeling of being chastened. Many of us have sunk into the depths of affliction. And here we are, asking for guidance, reciting purification, opening this dharma. So Toksan asked the old woman, do you know of a good Zen master around here? And she told him to go to Yutan Osho's place. And off he went to see the proponent of the school he had sought to discredit. And now, with utter humility, he was ready to be taught. His teacup was empty. We might wonder, was all that study all those years of sutra study, poring over the Diamond Sutra and making scholarly commentaries, was all of that in vain? No. No. Not in vain at all. No effort is ever wasted effort. All that you have done everything that you may think was just one big mistake all your generation of harmful karma and very importantly all your sincere regrets have brought you to this point and now you are ready. So when he got to Rutan's place, Toksan had no more scholarly answers. He had only questions. And Rutan finally said, it's getting late. You'd better take your leave. Toksan raised the bamboo blinds. It was dark. Rutan lit a candle in a paper lantern. Just as Toksan was about to take it, Rutan blew it out. Utter darkness. Nothing could be seen. And for the first time, at last, Toksan could see. His mind was a light. 
This is case 28 of the Mumon Khan, the Gateless Barrier. This morning, we walked to the obelisk and offered incense, pure water, chanting. We walked through Sangha Meadow and stood before the stupa where our founder's ashes are buried and offered incense and pure water from Beecher Lake, chanting Namudai Bosa. And it made me think of this letter that Edo Roshi wrote on Mandala Day, May 21st, 1984. Dear friend, please be patient in reading this long letter concerning matters related to my late master, Soen Roshi. First, I would like to invite you to come to Daibosatsu Zendo on the 4th of July to join with us in the ceremony at 2 p.m. of burying the ashes of Soen Roshi and Yogen Senzaki. When Soen Roshi was visiting Daibosatsu Zendo in the summer of 1982, one day, he and I, together with Mr. Yoshida, a Japanese stonecutter, took a walk in the cemetery, Sangha Meadow. At one point, we stopped and looked at Beecher Lake and the monastery beyond. So Roshi said, This is a good place for eternal rest. I said, in fact, I have been thinking of this very spot to bury part of your ashes if by chance you die before me. Suddenly, he took my right hand in his two hands, knelt on the ground, two hands, knelt on the ground, held my hand tightly and said, thank you. Thank you. That very day, he wrote Namu Dai Bo Sa in Chinese characters and asked me to write it in English letters. Mr. Yoshida carved it in stone. We had no idea that this particular piece would be used for the memorial stupa of Soen Roshi. And here's the drawing of it. And the other side, he actually reversed the slabs. On March 11th of this year, suddenly Soen Roshi passed away. On April 11th, I went to Yutakuji for his funeral service. His five Dharma heirs were invited and attended along with many others. After the funeral, we decided that Soen Roshi's ashes would be divided into two parts. On June 11th, one part will be buried beside Hakuin and Tore at Yutakaji. The other part will come to America 
to honor his work in America. They will be buried in Sangha Meadow at Daibosatsu Zendo at the exact spot where he knelt. Yogin Senzagi passed away in 1958. Half of his ashes were buried in Los Angeles. The other half went to Japan. And Soen Roshi brought them to New York in 1968. These ashes have been enshrined on the altar in the Dharma Hall of Daibosatsu Zendo ever since its founding. These two, you can't find them now because these two pioneer teachers' ashes will be buried side by side on the 4th of July. Once I wrote, Needless to say, without Soin Shaku's visits to America, D.T. Suzuki's enormous effort, Yogen Senzaki's half-century-long struggle, Soin Roshi's wisdom, Yasutani Roshi's tireless teaching, and our anonymous donor's great generosity, Daibosatsu Zendo would never have been born. But these distinguished people could not by themselves have made this birth possible. The greatest significance of international Daibosatsu Zendo Kongoji is that it has been established through the combined effort and ceaseless concern of all known and unknown teachers and students, brothers and sisters. Though it is impossible to specify a single founder of Daibusatsu Zendo, at this point, I feel it is most proper if we consider Soen Roshi as the founder and Yogin Senzaki as the karmic founder. I want to invite you to participate in the creation of a memorial called the Founders Fund to carry on their work for the Dharma in America. It has three purposes at least. One, to erect a memorial stupa in Sangha Meadow at Daibosatsu Zendo. Two, to publish the Soen Roku. Three, to send promising Dharma students to Japan for further study. The last thing I want to ask you is to write in the form of anecdotes any personal encounters you have had with Soen Roshi and send them to me. I am in the process of editing the Soen Roku, the sayings and doings of Master Soen, which will consist of his Teishos in English, the record of his pilgrimage to North America, and your experiences with him. And in, a, in 1986, on the 10th anniversary of Daibosatsu Zendo, mm. we had a special session ending on the 4th of July, and this book was ready for everyone. And I'll end with just a little passage from uh, Soen Roshi's uh, Teisho on this last trip that he made before he passed. This is from 1982. All on Master Inzai. 
getting true understanding, first of all, by true practice, zazen, everyday life by everyday life. Even when you are not trying to achieve something extraordinary, it will come to you all by itself. But Rinzai said to someone, it should be ordinary, everyday life, getting up, when tired, lying down, sitting is not a good word. Shitting is better. My pronunciation is very bad. So, shit in the zendo. <laughs> Without sitting, you can live. Without shitting, can you live? So, shitting is more important than sitting. So, Rinz, I said, shitting is Zen, not just sitting. Be careful, minute after minute, okay? You cannot separate from Zen. You cannot separate from the way, from Dharma. Cannot separate. Such a thing that can be separated is not Zen, is not the way, is not Dharma. Shitting, same thing. Urinating, call of nature, wonderful expression. So, shitting, urinating, putting on clothes, taking off clothes, each deed when time comes. Appreciate the meal, this meal. When tired, go to bed and sleep. Even sleeping is continuing in the way. Ordinary is extraordinary life. To realize this, there is, for example, the tea ceremony. When it is a formality, it is no good. Tea ceremony is to understand and to realize, actually, this is tea ceremony. Ceremony is important. Ceremony is wonderful, of course. But at the end, we make formally making the sound is no good. One drop is all. All is one. Drop. So, with this one drop, realizing, actualizing this endless dimension, universal life. <laughs>